And that's the opening bell for Round by Round, presented by Eastern Communications. Pabuhay Pilipinas, welcome world. I'm Boyat Season. And I'm Ryan Sangalia. Bill Velasco joins us later on in the show. On this edition of our program, we talk about an upcoming matchup that would finally happen next month. It'll be one-time world title contender Michael Desmarinas making his uh, return to the ring on the 4th of December 2021 versus Ernesto Saulog at the Elorde Sports Center in Paranaque. Mga kaibigan, uh, itong si Dasmarinas ay uh, hindi uh, nanalo at uh, hindi nagtugumbay sa kanyang World Championship bid against International Boxing Federation and WBA Bantamweight King Naoya Inoue on uh, June 19, 2021 at the Virgin Hotels in Las Vegas, Nevada. Si Dasmarinas po ay uh, na-knockout ni Inoue in three rounds. At pagkatapos po nung laban na yan, si Dasmarinas po uh, apparently uh, dropped out of the IBF rankings after being ranked number one. Although he's still ranked number 20 in the WBC uh, rankings uh, kung saan uh, ang current uh, title holder ay si Nonito Donaire. Now, how will an opponent like Saulog be a uh, gauge uh, as far as uh, Uh, the conditioning and the uh, current state of Dasparinas uh, will now be after that loss to uh, Inoue, Ryan? Well, I think this may be just what the doctor has ordered for Michael Dasparinas. We will find out if hot and spicy Dasparinas has turned sour against a uh, fellow former title challenger. You know, so long uh, has a good record. He had been... Uh, a contender, a fringe contender at one point, but uh, now he's sort of fallen into an opponent's role. So he's a gatekeeper. This is a, a good fight for Dustin Inez, uh to get back and uh, be active again after, you know, a crushing defeat to Noe in a way. So, um, you know, we want to see if Dustin Inez can be the fighter. You know, we've seen him be, you know, he is a, a talented fighter. He's a good boxer puncher. Uh, he was in over his head against Inoue, as virtually everyone is uh, in the sport. You know, he's one of the most talented fighters. Uh, so it's really no shame to lose to one of the best. But um, if he wants to get back in there and be a contender, uh, he has to really show out against Ernesto Salong, uh, who, um, you know, Dust Meninas really should be uh, a level above. So uh, we'll see what he has here. Uh, and uh this should be a good idea of where he is. If he can look impressive against Salong, uh, maybe he can go go back in, uh, and fight uh, a little bit higher level contender next time. Uh, if he doesn't, well, then we know that uh, Dust Marini is where he is in his career at this point. Well, as far as a lot of other boxing observers are uh, concerned, uh, they are they are putting this fight as some sort of a of a uh, tune-up fight for Dust Marini. Uh, but do you agree that They are putting this as some sort of a, of a tune-up fight for for Dasmarinas uh, in this quest to fight uh, somebody uh, on a higher ranking and eventually get into the thick of things once more. Yes, I believe that uh, Dasmarinas really does. He still has a good record. He's thirty and three. He can go back and fight uh, someone either um, challenging for a title that could build him up, you know, towards a title fight. Or he could, you know, uh, potentially get um, some paydays as a uh, a high-profile opponent. Uh, you know, it, it all depends on how he looks against so long. Um, you know, I always say there are no tune-up fights because at the end of the day, the other guy uh, will always have two hands of, of his own. And for all you know, you might be the one getting tuned up. So uh, Michael Dustmanius really has to um, show some urgency in his career. You know, show you know. He doesn't always fight um, to the most of to the best of his abilities, and uh, you know this is a fight where he really has to show everything. He has to be in great shape, and he has to come out, um, you know, with some urgency to convince people that no, you know, what he showed against uh, Noe Inoue isn't all that he's about. You know, he um, 
he is a much better fighter than uh, he showed against, you know, a pretty great uh, champion. Just to close it out, just to close this conversation out, could, could So Long pull off an upset? Yeah, why not? So Long is a puncher, you know, um, or he, he's had, you know, some pretty good, uh, he's shown some power in the past, even though his record doesn't suggest it. I think he's a better puncher than he's shown. Um, my guess is that if there will be a knockout, it will be from Dasmanenius towards So Long. Um, I remember, uh, I believe it was in 2018, when he had a pretty shocking knockout loss to uh, an unheralded fighter, Waldo Sabu. Um, so, y- y- you know, when it, when it comes to uh, Sao Long's chin, uh, you can't really depend on it, you know. But um, I think that Desmondinus will get some solid rounds here. Uh, but I don't know that Sao Long has uh, the mentality to go out there and, and try to close out a fight and try to um, and try to pull the upset. I think he may have um, sort of uh, resigned himself to being, you know, sort of an opponent. Uh, his loss to Christian Pitlorente, you know, who is a very talented fighter, but, you know, he's still a prospect. I think that kind of shows where he is. He's a gatekeeper at this point. And, and Desmarinius has to show that he's ready to crash that gate. For our second uh, topic, uh, we will now discuss uh, the uh, apparent Uh, declaration of a free agent status by Emmanuel Navarrete. Mga kaibigan, itong uh, two-time world champion si Emmanuel uh, Vaquero Navarrete is now uh, uh, currently analyzing the best options for his career after uh, starting a period of being a promotional free agent. Now, usually, mga kaibigan, itong mga uh, gatong klase ng fighter, of course, they always want what's best for them. And now that uh, with this declaration of being a free agent, uh, what will be in store for uh, somebody uh, like uh, Vaquero? But before you answer that question, is it a wise decision, Ryan Sungalia? Is it a wise decision for him to declare free agent status? Well, you know, um, I think he has to go out there and make the best deals for himself. You know, it, it's harder to get those big fights, you know, if you're not aligned with a promoter. Um, so that's sort of the issue that he has for himself, but you know, he's the top rated guy at featherweight right now. He's got, um, the WBO title. He, uh, he's made a little bit of a name for himself, but, um, the, what could happen is if you are a free agent, you could go to different promotions and make deals with different people that you maybe couldn't have made because of, uh, some promotional alliances. So that could be the, uh, the thing that, you know, works out in his favor, um, for instance, like if Navarrete was to fight, you know, Mark Maxayo, for instance, if Mike Maxayo is on PBC, he could now go and make a deal with Mark Maxayo, uh, you know, and another promoter. Whereas, um, you know, we've seen this work in the past, you know, uh, recently, uh, Canelo Alvarez has sort of uh, broken, uh, you know, the traditional promoter fighter ties, you know, where fighter will sign a long-term contract with somebody and try to just sort of stick to one person and let that person make his deals for himself. Uh, if never that they feel confident that he can go out there and make a deal for himself, that's better and say, okay, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over there. Yeah. Good for him. That, that's, that, that, that will work for him. It's worked for Canelo Alvarez um, to a, a lesser extent. It worked for Mikey Garcia where Mikey Garcia was able to look for the best financial deals for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, fighting on one fight contracts, you know, with the zone. And, and if it, if it was uh, advantageous to him, he'll go to PBC and he was able to make a lot of money without taking a whole lot of risk and, and being tied down long-term uh, where your, your interest will actually intersect with that of the promoter. Like, you know, if, uh, if there's a long contract and, uh, and you're on the downswing um, and it's advantageous to that promoter to try and cash you out against one of their ascendant fighters that, could happen so um but never at the shown that he's an exciting fighter that um to a lesser extent than say canelo alvarez he's in demand but when you have a belt you still have a place you have a, you have a seat at the table you may not be the head of the table but you'll have a seat how, how attractive is navarrete to let's say an organization the other organization's champions or the other organization's uh hierarchy that would consider Uh, pitting him uh, pitting him against their champion in order to maybe uh, unify belts and and eventually create a, a bigger a bigger purse for their fighters uh, in, in this well, case the fight. well that's the, the, the kind of hard thing to gauge right now because the biggest fight right now I would say for Navarrete 
would be against Oscar Valdez. Valdez is signed with top rank, you know, mm-hmm. who is the promotion that uh, uh, that Navarrete is declaring uh, independence from. So he may not be able to get that fight now because if he doesn't sign a long-term deal with top rank, uh, that's a fight that should have been one fight earlier, not one fight later, I, I would say. Uh, but Bob Arum is good at dangling those carrots. You know, that's a carrot for Bob to sort of try and lure Navarrete back into a longer term deal. Um, we saw this a little bit with Terrence Crawford, where Crawford was sort of asserting his independence from Bob Arum and saying, no, listen, you know what? Uh, my mind's made up. I'm moving forward. And Arum, all, all he could offer was, um, well, well, we'll offer him a one fight deal. We'll make the fight with uh, Errol Spence and, and, and Crawford's like, well, if you couldn't get me the fight when I was with you, why would you get the, me the fight when I'm not with you? So uh, it, it, uh, having a promoter can be uh, a, a path towards making bigger fights. I think with Navarrete, um, if he wants that Valdez fight, he'll have to sign a deal probably. Yeah, we'll uh, see what happens in the future as far as uh, Vaquero Navarrete is concerned. And we hope. It's going to be something big. For the next segment of today's program, and I turn over to our colleague, Bill Velasco. Thanks, Boyd and Ryan. You know, Sean Porter suddenly announced that he was going to retire after being knocked out. And uh, the funny thing is, he claims that he would have retired, win, lose, or draw, but he never said anything before the fight. But we are almost 100% sure that he will be back. Now, let's take a look at five of the greatest comebacks in boxing history. Number five, we start with Vitaly Klitschko. Now, he retired in 2004, came back in 2008. That's four years. That's a pretty long time to be at the peak of your game once again. He retired with a record of 35 and two with 34 knockouts, and he lost in two very unique manners. First, he lost due to shoulder injury to Chris Bird. Then he lost on cuts to Lennox Lewis in a fight that he was winning. So, you know, those two losses stained his record, but they're uh, pretty much losses that you can forgive. He retired with an assortment of injuries at the age of 33, so it's not really con- considered a premature retirement. But when he did come back, he won 10 straight fights, went 10-0, and 0, and won back the WBC belt. So he is at number five. Meanwhile, at number four is Mike Tyson. Now, Mike Tyson had to come back from another very unique uh, experience. He was in prison. We all know what happened when he tried to uh, sexually harass a parking attendant in Vegas. His supervisor intervened, and Tyson struck him. And as a professional boxer, you are not allowed to hit anybody outside of the boxing ring because your fists are considered licensed weapons. So he was imprisoned in 1992, returned in 1995, and won the WBC and WBA belts again. Remember, he was the youngest world heavyweight boxing champion ever. So Mike Tyson reestablished himself. Of course, he was you know, off to a pretty uh, rocky comeback. Then he lost those uh, controversial fights to Evander Holyfield, including the one where he bit his ear off, and then he was never the same again. Meanwhile, in number three, we, got, we have Sugar Ray Leonard, who retired in 1982, came back very briefly in 1984, then had a tremendous comeback back in 1987. Now, we all know the story of Sugar Ray Leonard, fantastic Olympic champion, won an Olympic gold medal despite having a broken hand throughout most of the tournament, became a multiple division champion. And you remember all those fights against uh, Roberto Duran, Tommy Hearns, Marvin Hagler, and many others. It was such a great era for the welterweight division. He retired in 1982 due to a detached retina after being undisputed welterweight champion. Then came back briefly in 1984, did not really do that well, stayed out of the limelight until 1987, when he had one of the greatest wins of his career, a debate split decision victory over marvelous Marvin Hagler. And this is one of the fights that Marvin Hagler was never really able to live down. 
Then he won the super middleweight of WBC and took on a one-armed light heavyweight champion named Donnie Lalonde. Lalonde had, uh, in, had an injured shoulder, which was practically held together by staples. And Sugar Ray Leonard defeated him and became a world light heavyweight champion again. Then he fought Roberto Duran in a rubber match, had another great fight against Tommy Hearns, and then inevitably went back into retirement. Next on our list, somebody very familiar to, to us because he came back again, and I'm going to get to that in a succeeding uh, episode. But Evander Holyfield first retired in 1994, a little over a year later, came back in uh, 1995. In 1994, he lost the world title to Michael Moore, then retired due to a heart ailment. He didn't do so well when he came back right away, defeated Mike Tyson. Remember, Mike Tyson was at that point considered nearly indestructible and then became the first champion after Muhammad Ali to win the world heavyweight title three times. Then all the way in 2000, he won the world heavyweight championship for a fourth time, setting a new record. Number one, of course, needs no further introduction. One of the greatest comebacks in any sport anywhere, Muhammad Ali. In 1967, at the peak of his career, he was stripped of his boxing license for refusing to be part of the mandatory draft which sent American soldiers to the Vietnam War. Now, he refused because he said he was never oppressed by the Viet Cong or any Vietnamese. He said he was being oppressed by his fellow Americans, so he would rather stay at home and fight for his, his rights in the U.S. Because of that, he was forced to stop boxing for three solid years and lost all his income, or dropped out of the limelight, but stood for his convictions. In 1970, he finally did come back. Of course, not in the limelight. He had to fight in some other places because places like Las Vegas, uh, California, and New York would not give him a license to fight. Then his career really skyrocketed because of all the attention that he drew. Remember the trilogy with Frazier, fighting George Foreman, these guys were all Olympic champions. Ali was the light heavyweight champion as Cassius Clay back in 1960. Frazier was the 1964 Olympic heavyweight champion. Foreman was the 1968 Olympic heavyweight champion. So these guys were really heavy hitters. And Muhammad Ali did inevitably overcome all of them to become the first man in history to win the world heavyweight title three times. Yan po ang kasaysayan na mga pinaka Pabibigat na pagbabalik sa boxing. Balik sa inyo, Boyet at Ryan. Thank you, Bill. We now go to our Fearless Fighter, brought to you by Eastern Communications. And we uh, turn our attention to a female amateur legend who is turning pro. And I will talk to a guy who wrote a fantastic article on this woman. And we're talking about none other than Christina Cruz, who will make her professional debut very, very soon. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, Ryan, what makes an, a, a female amateur legend like Christina Cruz very special, Ryan? Well, you know, actually, I remember back in the day, I, I remember seeing her maybe 10 years ago uh, when she was just starting her Golden Gloves runs. Um, and this was a different time in boxing where, where men uh, did not look at women as like, oh, you're going to be a great fighter or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, she came down to the gym where I was training at in uh, Hackensack, New Jersey, and she was just hitting the bag. A, the whole gym stopped, a whole gym full of men, amateurs, professionals, journalists stopped and watched her hit the bag. We were so impressed by what we saw from her. So she was sort of a trendsetter in, in that regard, even back then. But after winning 10 New York Golden Gloves titles, that's a, that's a record. Um, and basically doing everything in the, that an amateur fighter could do, except for going to the, to the Olympics. Um, she's turning professional. She, she turned professional in August. She's having her second pro fight uh, this Saturday in New York. And, um, you know, she's fighting just walking distance from her home. You know, she lives in New York City. Uh, but fighting without the headgear after all those years of being a top amateur fighter, 
um, you know, you, you have to really respect her, her taking her career to the next level and and um, just the fearlessness that she shows. You know, if, well, women's boxing has really uh, taken a big leap uh, in recent years. And uh, for for her to, as you said, uh, uh, join in the fray or uh, get into the, 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 the meat of the matter, so to speak, uh, is something that, that a lot of us, of course, would be looking forward to. But looking at the landscape of her uh, weight class right now, how do you think she will be faring? I think that she has a great, she stands a great chance of making something happen. Not, you know, in, in, the, in the distant future, but I think soon. I think you know, she's, she's a, a little bit late to the game in terms of having been a top amateur for a long time and not having gone, uh, you know, starting her pro career, you know, earlier in on when she could have. But um, I think that she would be ready for a world championship opportunity within the next, um, you know, year or so. Uh, you know, I think time is of the essence with her. Um, I think that she really wants to get a move going. But, um, you know, we're talking about Marlon Esparza, who was someone that she had fought. Um, you know, in the amateurs, that's a, that's a big fight potentially for her. Um, you know, there's uh, Arely Musino who had a fight recently. Um, she's always tough. She's a veteran. Uh, I think that Christina Cruz has the talent and the skills that um, even with very few pro fights, she can go out there and and and, uh, and possibly uh, beat some of these uh, top female flyweights. Well, Marie Bigan, uh, a lot of female fighters have now really. Uh started to get to get their uh, their notoriety so to speak in the world of boxing you have uh, of course uh, already two females in the boxing hall of fame and, and uh, more to come i'm very sure of that that will be inducted in the boxing hall of fame very, very, uh, in the coming years and uh, for uh, for somebody like a top amateur like uh, like Christina Cruz who's now set to uh, to be in the professional ranks Will, uh, as Ryan said, a bit late in the game, but I am pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of eyes and there'll be a lot of fans out there that will that will be very interested to see her progress in the very near future. Okay, Marimiga, now is the time for Reliable Connections. Eastern Communications Fiber One is ideal for powering small, medium enterprises that are on their way to digitizing their business and pushing forward to a strong and fearless tomorrow. Do contact 5300-7000 or visit their website, eastern.com.ph for more information about the service. And that is our fearless fighter, Christina Cruz, as brought to you by Eastern Communications. And that's the final bell for today's episode of Round by Round, presented by Eastern Communications. I'm Boyet Cesar. I'm Ryan Sangalia. We're on Facebook at 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and on our YouTube channel right after. So like, follow, share, and subscribe now. On tomorrow's uh, edition of our program, it'll be Nissi Icasiano, Ryan Sangalia, and Ruyores Truly that'll be answering the bell. This has been Round by Round. All boxing, all Filipino, all the time. Take care. <laughs>